As we've talked about over the last uh, few weeks, um, we are concluding our Plan A series this morning with some sharing, some prayer, some worship. And we're going to have the opportunity to pray together. We're going to have the chance to pray in families. We're going to have a chance to pray as individuals. Now, I know that these times can often make some people squirm a little bit in your seat, and so I just want to say from the outset, there's no need for you to feel, well, I understand that you may feel that, but I want you to feel safe in this space. So it's okay for you to pray on your own. There's no obligation for you to join a group or to pray out loud. We want you to feel comfortable. Um, the, the joy is that we will get to hear how God has been using some various people in ordinary opportunities to sow gospel seeds in conversations. You'll also find on your seat um, a prayer card which has some prayer points on it that can help direct you if you'd like to pray on your own um, and direct all of us actually as we pray as well. But we don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable so there is no pressure to, to pray out loud. Um, maybe this morning you might like to join a group but just listen and resonate and agree silently in your heart and that is completely okay. But as we move into our first opportunity for corporate prayer, which we wanted our kids to be a part of this morning, I'm going to ask Luke and Jenny and Cam to come and share some of the experiences of God moving in their conversations. Thanks, guys. Such gallant young men. <laughs> Ladies first. I'm sure it was um, age before beauty, but anyway. <laughs> um, I'm going to share this morning. Um, at the beginning of the Plan A series, I uh, happened to run into a woman who was a mum who had children at primary school um, at the same time as my children. So this was someone I had known of for a very long time. But she was very keen to share about how difficult life had become with her husband who was seriously ill. I really felt for her and in that week that followed, I believe the Holy Spirit was prompting me to contact her. Of course, there were objections going on in my head. I can't remember her last name. I certainly didn't have her phone number. Would she think it was an intrusion? She was always a fairly private person. But eventually I decided to pop a note in her letterbox, inviting her for a coffee. I did this and included my mobile number and to my surprise, she responded positively the next day with a text and we set a date for a coffee. Unfortunately, we couldn't have the coffee as it turned out as her husband had to have emergency surgery on that day. But we have been able to stay connected through several texts and we'll try for a coffee again in a couple of weeks. I feel extremely sad about her situation and I am praying for her daily as Dave encouraged us to do. But I am grateful for the opportunity to share God's love and kindness with her. And my prayer is that we will all take up the challenges that have been presented throughout this wonderful series. Thank you. Um, hi, church. Uh, so the one that uh, God has laid on my heart throughout this Plan A series has been a friend of mine from uni. So I met him uh, two, two years ago uh, in one of my chemistry courses. And um, yeah, God just placed him on my heart to become friends with him. Uh, he is someone who comes from a very devout Muslim uh, uh, background. Uh, he's an international student. Um, but we just found it, uh, ourselves having such great conversations and then end up catching up, uh, catching up uh, for lunch every week. Um, and so we have continued to stay in contact um, over the last two years. Um, but through this Plan A series, I've sort of uh, learned a little bit about this relational evangelism in the sense of sharing my faith with him while still allowing him to share his faith with me. And so, um, although 
uh, we didn't end up sharing any more courses together other than that first one. Um, Rachel and I have been able to also invite him over to our house and, and um, just listening to his stories and some of the troubles he's found in Australia and then uh, some of his situations back home. Um, we've both just had this compassion uh, for this friend and it's been incredible being able to share some Bible stories with him as he's also been able to share and compare uh, the version of the stories in the Quran. And um, we found ourselves having such intentional conversations about Australia and this world and about religion. And it's been really incredible. And he's genuinely become a close friend of mine, not just sort of a project that I'm just seeking to convert. Um, but as I've thought more about what it would mean for him to become a Christian, I... Um, I've sort of got intimidated because ultimately I wondered whether, you know, would I be willing to give up sort of my whole heritage and my family in order to follow Jesus like he would have to uh, if he was to see Jesus as more than just a prophet. And so this Plan A series has sort of been challenging me because I sort of ran into this wall of feeling inadequate or recognising that no words I could say to him would ever sort of change his mind or change who he is. And so I recognise that it's only because of the power of God working in his heart that he can come to know Jesus as more than just a prophet. And so, um, yeah, through Dave's challenges, just regularly praying for this one on my heart, it's been so transformative um, and recognizing that I just need to keep on showing up and showing him the love of Jesus um, every time we interact and hopefully it will be a friendship for a long haul. So I just wanted to share that interaction with you all. Morning, everyone. My name's uh, Luke, um, and I want to share with you uh, a story about how the Lord has brought into my everyday life both opportunities to share about Him and how He's actually pre prepared me to share about Him also. The, I've worked with this colleague of mine since 2012. Uh, when I first started working with him, I was just a trainee doctor, uh, and he was an anaesthetic nurse. Um, and to be honest, I always say that he taught me more than half of anaesthetics. Um, he'd been doing it for a long time and watched and seen, and he'd often whisper in my ear, say, Luke, don't do that, do this. I say, thanks, mate, thanks. And that was the, the story of our relationship early. And he, we went through lots of difficult and stressful times in work together in terms of uh, patients that are unstable and very unwell or on the point of death, and uh, we formed quite a close friendship in those times. Um, Sadly, due to work uh, situations, we were, we were separated for a number of years until he turned back up in my theatre again at a different hospital at a different time, having sought me out specifically to work with me on these Thursdays. Um, I was delighted to be back with him, and then I found that he had a reason for being there. He was seeking the blessed life and peace and security and to conquer the problems that he found in his own life and his character. He found that, uh, or his hope was set at this time in meditation uh, and the type where um, you focus on one part or one breath or a feeling or a sensation and you separate yourself from the worries of the world. And he'd just been on a two-week course and he was overjoyed at the results that he was experiencing in his life. Um, and he'd come because he knows that I too seek to grow and develop. And he came to evangelise me, say, Luke, you need to go on this course. It'll change your life. I remember listening to him and being overjoyed for him and his change, but having a deep discomfort in my heart about that and not really understanding why. Um, and knowing that that was my opportunity to speak to him and I'd missed him. I'd missed it. Um, believing that Jesus was my source of joy and security. Um, and so I went away sad and was praying about it and I got home and then Pam said to me, Luke, you need to read this book. It's called Deeper Still, Finding Clear Minds and Full Hearts Through Biblical Meditation. And I read it and the Lord equipped me to understand the difference between secular medication and what it is to meditate on him. That we fill our minds with ourselves and that what comes from our heart can only be broken but we need a re restoration, a new heart that comes from him only. And so I set about meditating on him and on his word. And I meditated on Psalm 1. 
And then I came back to Krishna the next week and he said to me, he said, Luke, Matt, I'm struggling. Life's gone south, you know. I think I need to just do this more. And he says, how are you going with your meditation? And I said, Krishna, let me share with you Psalm 1 that I've been meditating on. And uh, I read to him these words. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his Lord day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Not so the wicked, for they are like chaff and blown away. And I was able to share with him, I say, Krishna, what I've come to understand is that I'm the wicked and like the chaff that gets blown away. But there's one whose delight is in him, who is the tree. And he invites me to him. And so when I meditate, I meditate on that truth. That's there for you too. Um, the, and so in reflection, I can see that the Lord gave me this friendship that's blessed and challenged me. That when I grow, I can help others grow. And that it's actually his community that equips me to bring his word. And in the end, <laughs> I've become the tree because of who he is and the gifts that he's given to me. And uh, I want that for my mate too. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Luke and Jenny and Cam. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14 and 15, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that comes first, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. My eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. And so this morning we have the chance to be humble before the Lord, first and foremost, um, as we respond to God's call over our life, and we have the opportunity to pray. And so the first thing we're going to pray for this morning are people in our own families who don't yet know Jesus or who aren't walking with him at this time. Maybe they know of him or have experienced him at some point, but don't, you aren't yet walking with him. And we thought what would be nice at this point to do is to huddle in our families. And so if there are members of your family and extended family, that are here this morning. I'm just going to ask that we gather together, which means you might need to stand up and move, but that's okay. We're allowed to do that. Um, and we're going to spend some time praying for our families, that hearts might be softened to God's calling. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that now, and um, you'll know when it's time to, to come back to your seat. Let's pray together. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth and I've been really surprised after Plan A how many opportunities there have been to share, which I wouldn't have even thought that was part of it, just sowing a seed and it's so easy. So my story today is about sharing with a stranger. So I was at the gym, which is the second, my second favourite place next to church, and so I'm there when a friend of I and I were going to have coffee. I was talking to our trainer and a lady who was already having coffee called me over and she said, oh, is that Zach? And I said, yes. And so we ended up sitting down having coffee with her. During the conversation, she shared with me that her husband had died three years ago. And I offered my condolences to her because she said she wasn't dealing very well with it. And our conversation went on and she asked me something about my background. And I said to her that my husband had also died, but it was 24 years ago when my son was 11. And she said to me, oh, that must have been really, really hard. And I said, well, yes, it was, but we had such a strong Christian faith. And I felt so much peace 
because of my faith and the people around me and what I believed in. And I actually just left it at that and we continued. But I decided to ask if she wanted to exchange phone numbers, which she did. So I sent her my number and she responded and said, you know, thanks. And I went back and I said to her, stay strong, just in a text. And her response was prayer hands and a flower. So I thought, oh, well, that's pretty amazing. I didn't expect that. So there might be some belief there, but I don't know. So my intention this week is to call her and organize coffee so we can continue along with what that seed was sown might do. Mm. And that was my story. Thank Good. you. Hi, my name's Rita, and I guess the hardest part about being challenged about sowing the seed um, of God's word into people's lives is that we can't actually always see what's happening. So I'd like to relate to you a story that started 40 years ago as I was teaching at the Amberley C and K kindergarten. This meant that I had a committee that would meet with me every month. They'd actually give me a paycheck and we would talk about business matters about the kindergarten. There were representatives from the Air Force and the local community. Well, Leo and I got to the point where we realised that this meeting and this gathering was an opportunity, a social opportunity. Leo and I found ourselves in this group in which there was a policeman, two aircraft engineers, their wives and their families, all of whom I taught. It's a normal practice in the forces to socialise with those in your immediate circle because many of them don't have family around. It didn't take long before the committee members, Leo and I, got together for some gatherings, dinners, chats, and we formed a very interesting sporting group. It was an indoor cricket team and we called ourselves the Mixed Bag because we were exactly that. We had many gatherings and discussions about religion and Leo and I were the only Christians in this group. One couple was agnostic and our attempts to present Christ sometimes was literally shot down in flames. <laughs> this didn't stop healthy discussions. We didn't take it personally. There was never any ill feeling because everyone was given an opportunity to express their thoughts and their personal beliefs. It was in this time that I believe God moved and he started working in these conversations and he started working in their hearts and their minds. As time passed, we all went our different ways, but we did intend to keep this gathering of the eight. It then became six because one, uh, one couple was shipped over to Malaysia. Flew, flown over to Elijah. <laughs> we would hear how each of these separate couples were now settling into their new situations and to our delight they would always mention that there was some Christian in their life. And it was an encouragement for us to see God's master plan in his garden of believers. Well, we kept up Christmas greetings each year and over time each couple would write, by the way, thought you'd like to know we've become Christians. We know that there were other people on the pathway of each couple's faith journey. For us, Leo and I felt we were just a small part of the gardening process. God brought it all together. We still see two of the couples today. Although it's not frequently, it's still meaningful because we have a big history. One couple, the most against God initially, are now with the Lord Jesus in heaven, which is we are eternally thankful. What I've taken away from plan A is that I'm just responsible to take an opportunity that I get and I pray that I'll have the courage to say what I need to say and I'm going to leave that miracle to the Lord Jesus in his overall plan for other people's lives and their salvation. Mm. Very good. How good is it to hear stories of how God is challenging us and using us? In this next prayer time, we have the opportunity to pray for people in our friendship network. 
our friends who don't yet know Jesus. And over the course of these five weeks, we've been encouraged and challenged to think of one or two people that we really want to pray earnestly for. Um, There's a prayer card on your chair. If you want to flip that over, you can write the name of that person if you wish to. Um, But right now, we're going to take a moment to gather in groups of three or four, just people around you. And we're going to pray for those people in our friendship networks. And young people, our kids, it's nearly time for you to head out to field. But before you do, uh, Jen thought it would, would be nice for you to stay in and pray in your field groups. And so prep to grade three are going to go over this side of the auditorium. You're going to meet your field leader there. And then four to six are going to meet your field leader on this side of the auditorium. So let's spend some time now uh, praying for that one or two people that God has laid on your hearts. Gather in small groups and we'll pray together. This won't be as long, I don't think. I swear. This will be shorter because I didn't realise how long. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about our little cul-de-sac that we live in and we've got, um, I think there's eight places, eight little, and we all know each other pretty well. We've all, especially COVID, that brought us all together to look out for each other, bring in bins for each other, collect mail for each other, all sorts of things. And so we've got to know our cul-de-sac pretty well. I hone in on one particular neighbour. I'm going to call him Jack. It's not his name. I did smile about three words um, that describe him, that I think describes him. He's colourful, he's cranky, and he's curious. He's colourful because most sentences he uses are accompanied by quite colourful language. (laughs) He's cranky with his neighbours and refuses to communicate with them over different issues and the silence has gone on for months, sometimes years. He's curious. He's curious about what we do and where we go and the number of people that arrive at our home. And he loves to feel trusted when we give him the gate key if we're away. Curiosity brings him over fairly often. He loved being the first one to be invited to look through our home, our flooded home last year with all the damage that had occurred. He's definitely not a Christian, but he's open to hearing stories of what we do in all of our church activities. He loves my lemon butter and my scones. He's a long-term project for John and I, and over the years we've enjoyed building, we've been in that cul-de-sac five years, going on six this year building that relationship of friendship um, with him in particular. I love cutting past and through the cranky. And I found underneath all that a kind-hearted man who's been generous over the years to many around him. He's a lonely man who's now listening and ready for people to listen to him. He's a grieving man as the ailments of old age now stop him from doing um, many of the active things he loved to do. So I know when I knock on the door, it'll be at least an hour before I can leave or more. (laughs) But we'll continue to pray for this character and his quiet little wife. The series plan has sharpened my intentions and we feel that we can build now on the friendship that we've had. So some of these friendships that we've had for a long time, we can actually sharpen them. How blessed we are in this church with the prayerful and dedicated people who head up our ministries because, you know, the great thing is I have full confidence that whatever I can get him to in our church communities, and that's I've been able to get him to rummage sales Christmas at Ashgrove, that he'll be welcomed and he'll be loved and that God will do the rest because he loves this man so much. So I thank all those dedicated leaders and people who run all the ministries. I'm aiming to try and get him to the exercise class because that's what he needs at the moment. So um, 
keep, we'll keep praying for this man that the, the little doors and segues in in our ministry areas will bring this man to a full recognition of God in his life. So if you know me, you know I'm much more comfortable speaking to you one-on-one -on -one than I am up here. But I'm, I've got a little story here. A Scotsman, two Australians, walk into a Byron Bay coffee shop. They might be called John, Trevor and Pete. Actually, a seed has been planted the day before this happened when the Scotsman's wife, who's Welsh, who may be called Liz, struck up a brief exchange with a nearby couple about coffee shops to visit when they go to Brisbane. The next day when we three guys wandered back in for our usual, the same couple had already settled in. We reconnected and I passed on a couple of coffee, coffee places they could try in Brisbane. We chatted a bit more and were asked this question. So what do you guys talk about when you get together? I quickly reflected on uh, the last couple of hours and would typically have said coffee, or if you're with Trev, the Sydney Swans and whether Buddy would kick the fourth highest goal uh, quantity in next season. Um, it's hard to have a conversation with Trev without that coming up. Uh, I would have typically talked about music, or talking to John about Queensland Health Capital Works rollout. John never discloses the details, by the way, just the big, big picture. But I didn't say any of those things. I found myself saying theology. Now, the three notable things about this, I've never said that before. It sparked sincere interest, and fortunately it was true. We then talked about our faith journey and how God continues to reveal himself to us. We agreed that God exists and that the Big Bang is a seriously inadequate scientific explanation of how we came to be. We talked about a contemporary writer we had found really helpful, um, and they wrote down John Lennox's name uh, as he kind of unpacks the, the wonders of the universe and mathematics and all things scientific. Then they brought up a contemporary writer, musician, Nick Cave, and his faith journey. Um, he'd written that he'd wondered what Jesus was writing in the sand when the Pharisees brought to him a woman accused of adultery. Trev, in his own humble but convincing way, offered that he'd read that the tradition of a rabbi was that they would write out the actual law being considered, which demonstrate that he knew it well. Jesus knew the law but had replaced it with grace and forgiveness which resonated. The chat continued warmly and respectfully and we moved on to music. It turns out that they met playing in clubs, this couple. The genre of folk noir, which I had to look up, neo-folk, she described it as folk music without the happiness. <laughs> uh, which may explain the earlier reference to Nick Cave. Uh, we explained that we weren't musicians, only drummers. Uh, who, who hang around with musicians and that we played at church. They were interested and wanted to know which one, so we told them and we parted ways. But as I pondered the exchange and what God might do with it in their lives, and we pray that he might do something, uh, and the light in the darkness line from that last song resonated, something else dawned on me. What a generous question we were asked. So what do you guys talk about when you get together? Sometimes we think we need to have all the answers, but there's still lots for us to learn from others, fellow believers or not, and we grow. Thank you. Thanks, Peter and Gay. Um, as we do our final time of prayer this morning, we're going to pray for our church, pray for the ministries that connect regularly with members of our wider community, both here in Ashgrove and also the surrounding suburbs. 
um, things that meet on a weekly basis, like the Our Ladies Craft Group, who do, uh, um, Gail does a devotion with them every week. Um, religious instruction at Oakley, our Genesis Youth and our Jam Kids and Ashgrove Community Care. Um, we also have opportunities through the courses that we run and the events like Easter and Christmas. And so let's spend just a little bit of time just on our own in quiet reflection and prayer um, for our church community and for our wider community as they experience the gospel through us as a church and the ministries that we offer to them. Can we pray just on our own for some time?